This program contains language that may be objectionable to some viewers. Discretion is advised. Principal funding for Meet the Past with Crosby Kemper III has been provided by the Enid and Crosby Kemper Foundation. What if you could step back in time and talk with some of Kansas City's most historic figures, the innovators and achievers who've left their mark on our town, on our nation? What would you ask if you could meet the past? This week, Crosby sits down with folklorist, anthropologist, and author Zora Neale Hurston, who emerged through the Harlem Renaissance and wrote the American literary classic, Their Eyes Were Watching God. I want to take you back to May 1st, 1925, in New York City. Charles Johnson, the editor of Opportunity Magazine, the magazine of the Urban League, has initiated a literary contest, Negro Americans uh, and their writing. And he invited a, a group that ultimately was 316 people. And among those people were Fanny Hurst, probably the best-selling novelist of the 20s and 30s, Eugene O'Neill, uh, Carl Van Vechten, one of the leading novelists and critics. And also there were James Weldon Johnson, Paul Robeson, and of course, Langston Hughes from Kansas City, Aaron Douglas from Kansas City, and Claude McKay, who uh, had uh, gone to K-State and had to go through Kansas City to get to K-State. <laughs> therefore, ther therefore my, my contention, the origins of the, Har the Harlem Renaissance is in Kansas City. <clears throat> Langston Hughes and County Cullen won the poetry prizes, but the most prizes on that day, four prizes, the Opportunity Magazine Literary Contest went to a woman who had published only one story up to that point. And ladies and gentlemen, here she is, Zora Neale Hurston. This is the way she came into the after party after the award ceremony. My mother made sure we all read. How you know, are you doing, Mr. Kemper? May I call you Zora? Oh, sadly. Everybody calls me Zora. I'm everybody Zora. May I call you Miss Crosby? You, yes, ma'am. You may call me anything you like. OK. OK. This is my chair. This is... How y'all doing? Who's everybody? Hey, everybody. Now, so, so Zora, you know, as has been said, you know, you are the party. But you, cre you created overnight uh, a sensation. You, your, your stories uh, won, won two prizes. Your play uh, won a prize. And the play was? Colorstruck! Colorstruck. <laughs> hmm. and, 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 and the stories, the stories, uh, the stories were spunk and uh, drenched in, in sunlight. Drenched uh, in light. And, drenched in light, sorry, yeah. And, and Black Death, and in Black Death, in Black Death, a story that, that won one of these prizes, you say, the Negroes of Eatonville know a number of things that the hustling, bustling white man never dreams of. <coughs> now tell me, what was so special about Eatonville? Eatonville was your home, was where you grew up. Eatonville was my home, and Eatonville was a very special place. And we knew how special we were. My father was the mayor, we had a city council, we had good schools, so we didn't need jails. And when I got to New York... <laughs> so when I got to New York, I realized that those people didn't see themselves reflected in everything around them like we did in Eatonville. Now, there is this, this the great story drenched in, in, in sunlight that you, that you wrote. There's a little girl, Isis Watts, who's the star of this, the protagonist of this, this story, who seems maybe to be a lot like you. She's pretty outgoing, too. I see as a little girl who sits on a fence post. And I used to sit on, my, on the fence post in front of my grandmother's house. Well, I knew and I see knew that the world was bigger than what we were seeing. So we wanted to see more of it. The other character that seems to be regular in the stories 
in your in, and and in their eyes for watching God, the novels, and but also in your uh, your folklore books, uh, the folklore stories that you tell. And we'll go into that in a little bit, but uh, are, are about mules. There are lots of mule stories. You know, the people who criticize me about mules, they didn't grow up in the country. Mules then were very important to us. And, and everybody had one. If they didn't have one, they wanted one. So I wrote about a lot of them. So you, you, you grew up in this town. It's an all-black town. And you, you say uh, uh, in, in your autobiography, Dust Tracks uh, on the Road, uh, that you didn't even know you were black. See, when you grow up in a town where everybody looks like you, you don't think about color. You, know, you don't think about color because nobody looks any different. Now, we might have been a few different shades. Well, I had this friend, Barbara Jean, and one time her mama took me on the train with them down to, down to Orlando, which was only like five miles away for real. And she took a picture, and when I looked at the picture, I said, well, Barbara Jean, we're different colors. And her mother said, well, of course you're different colors, Zora. You're just a nigger. Well, I got really mad at her. And I don't know if I was mad because she said I was a nigger or if I was mad because she said I was just <laughs> a nigger. And I just didn't like her anymore after that. But then I did come to realize that people are different, and that lady made sure that I knew that. And, and you read a lot of mythology books, and, which is interesting. You read a lot of mythology, and you, you, you talk about Hercules' oath. And, and about his ha having to make a decision between committing his life to duty or pleasure. And for a young girl, you, you, you liked his choice, the choice of duty. That sense of duty and taking care of folks, that was kind of inbred in me. And, and my mother was very special to me. One time, Mr. Kemper, she called me and she said, Zoe, honey, I need you to do something for me. She said, I'm getting ready to pass from this life to the next. She said, Zora, I want you to promise me something. Now, when those ladies from your daddy's church come to help me pass, promise me that you won't let them pull the pillow from under my head, that you won't let them cover the clock, and that you won't let them cover the mirror. Now, I thought about that real hard for a while, because if they pulled the pillow out from under her head, then when her soul left her body, it would have a smooth transition. And if you covered the clock, then time would stand still for my mother. And if part of the mirror was exposed, then when my mama's soul flew past it, part of it would stick to the mirror, and she'd always be here to take care of me. Well, one day I was sitting out in the yard, and I was playing with my doll, Miss Corn Shuck. <laughs> and I saw the ladies from my daddy's church coming. And I looked inside. And the ladies were pulling and tugging and trying to get that pillow out from under my mama's head. And one had covered the clock and the other had covered the, the mirror. So I ran in there and I grabbed that cover off that clock. And I screamed and I screamed and I screamed. And when I was about at the height of my screaming, I looked up and I saw my daddy in the door. And I was almost relieved. Now see, I knew my daddy had relations with other women, but I thought he loved my mother enough that he would help me keep my promise to her. But I guess he didn't, because he scooped me up from the base of that bed and carried me out of that room grief, self-despisement and all. And he deposited me on the other side of the door. Your, your daddy got another mama, stepmama. He did. Very fast. Real fast. Did didn't work too well for you. He married a woman that didn't like my mama's children. And we didn't like her neither, but he chose her, and, not us. And, and you, you tell the story in Dust Tracks, you almost killed her. I tried to. Tried to. <laughs> and so you left home at, at a very young age. He again, put me on the train. We're and not 100% sure away. how old you were when you left, but about 13, maybe. I was nine, sir. And you could embellish in my age. We're going to have this problem, I can tell. But, uh, <laughs> You, you, you go through a lot, uh, some schooling here and there, but you're basically supporting yourself. So you're working in various jobs, and including ultimately a Gil Gilbert and Sullivan troupe. That was fun. And, and that takes you to Baltimore. And finally, you enroll in the Morgan Academy in Baltimore, uh, which is part of, uh, it was related to Morgan State, the historically black university in, in Baltimore. And you do pretty well there. I do great. My mama made sure that we all love to learn. But when I got to Morgan Academy, I wanted to finish high school. So I went there, then I went to Howard Prep, and then I went to Howard 
University. Howard University. And, 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 but maybe more than that, there, there was around, in, in, we're talking about the early 1920s, uh, a, a, a literary salon uh, that, in, that included some of the most famous names in, in African American or Afro American, as they said at that point, uh, literature. You got to know W. Burkhart Du Bois mm -hmm. uh, was, was frequently there. James Weldon Johnson, yes. author of the Autobiography of an Ex-Colored Man, yes. God's Trombones, yes. uh, and and, uh, and and maybe most importantly at that point, Alan Locke. Yes. Well. <clears throat> Not always that important to you, obviously, uh, but but you you got you, you became a part of this group called the Saturday Nighters, which was the literary salon, and and and, uh, and got and went to work for the for the literary magazine at Howard, published a story in the Stylus, mm -hmm. and which got got the attention of some of those folks and some of the folks in in New York. Stylus was actually what got me started, because when Alain Locke started that, you ha he had to see and the man who worked with him and putting that organization together, but you had some kind of writing potential. So just being in it helped. Well, it ended up that they published my work, they liked my work, I won prizes, I got money, I was happy, they got and, published. And, and money, money, money being a pretty important thing because while, you know, you're on your own. I mean, you got no, money no help. Money was very important. You got no help from home and no help from pretty much anybody. That's right. No scholarships, et cetera. Because you, in fact, put yourself through Howard working as a manicurist. Yes. A waitress. Yes. And you know, and it's, made sometimes. And made. Uh, so you, you're you're working hard, and 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 still you have time to write and do do these things, and you come to the attention with this uh, the, 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 the the story drenched in sunlight that we've yeah. we've talked about, Isis yeah. Watts, mm -hmm. uh, and 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 so you become a part of the Harlem Renaissance. And there are kind of these factions at, at this point in the 20s in Harlem and in, in, in Negro literature at this point. Dr. Du Bois uh, runs uh, the uh, uh, Crisis Magazine, which is a magazine of the NAACP. Mm -hmm. And Opportunity is the Urban League And magazine. Opportunity is the Urban League and Charles Johnson. But there's this kind of, there, there's this distinction, even though Du Bois is in here, between what Du Bois wants to do, which is, is advance the race. And, and, and then what Locke and, and, and Johnson at that point and others want to do, which is really advance the literature and the, the aesthetics. And where did you come down on all that? The I came down right smack where they should have been. Because <laughs> I knew that in order to advance the race, you had to know the race. And so somebody had to save those stories. Now, me and Langston Hughes in particular, uh, we decided that we wanted to tell the story of the folk. So that's where I was. I wanted them to see that we had to save the stories. So real, real Negro life is, 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 was, your, was your watchword at that point. And you're in New York, but you've got something else you've got to do at the same time, which is finish your education. You yes, show sir. up with a dollar fifty in your pocket. I have one dollar and fifty cents, no friends, no relatives, no place to stay, no food. And now I'm here talking to our crowds of the camp of the family. And I, and I want to say pretty special for me to be talking to Zora Neale Hurston. <laughs> but so you enroll as the first black person to matriculate and graduate Barnard College, the women's part of uh, Columbia University. Yes. Thank you, thank you. And that's because I have friends. I have friends along the line of uh, Mr. Kemper here. I had Miss um, Anna Nathan Myers, who was one of the founders of Barnard College, and she was a good friend of mine. We met at a party. She liked me. Everybody liked me. <laughs> and she made a scholarship possible. Now you, you were, and, and actually most of your life, you had to work very hard. I you never, you never had a lot of money. No. And, and, uh, but you have these patrons, not only Annie Nathan Meyer, but Fanny Hurst herself, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Ms. Wonderful Hurst. Wonderful woman. Then the, really the most problematic one is, is Charlotte Mason, whom you called Godmother. Mm -hmm. And she provided money to you during, during the course of this. And you actually signed a contract with her. Mm -hmm. She provided money to you, and you said she could, the contract said she could control your writing. So you couldn't publish anything without her permission. That's an extraordinary thing. She did. She gave me money. She, uh, she gave me $200 a month. Uh, also, she owned my work. So it was important that I gather 
my stories and write stories, but also it was important to me that she not get everything. Right. Well, you had an interesting term for, for these patrons, and, there were, and there, the, the, the white women in particular, patrons of, of, of black writers. You're talking about my Negrotarians. The Negrotarians, yeah. That, that's pretty good. And then you had another term. You invented all these terms that everybody else likes to use them. And, and the whatnot. Way they you, you, you also had, had, a, had a term for the black writers themselves. Yes. Uh, they were the literati. Uh, and occasionally I would call them the niggerati. <laughs> so, so you, you know, you're hanging out with the, the literati of, of uh, Harlem, and at the same time, you're, you're getting this education from Franz Boas, a great anthropologist, and you, you begin to get these grants. You're about, to, I think, the first person ever to get two Guggenheim grants, and you go off to the South to study folklore, which yes. really you're studying in a way where you came from, of course, so you're the perfect person to do it. Thank you. Yeah. I'm and, glad they recognized it, yeah, too. Yeah. <laughs> and, the and, you know, eventually becomes mules and, and, and men. They're the mules again, by the way. Uh, and, and, but you, you, you go after the story of Marie Laveau, who's the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the queen of conjurers and, and, and hoodoo. Uh, I studied to be the last voodoo queen. And I had to have voodoo, because that was my mama's religion. And she's the one who supported me. And I thought that if I had voodoo, then that would keep me close to her. Now, you've, you've mentioned, we've mentioned, uh, we've talked a little bit about Kansas City's own Langston Hughes, who was yes. in many ways your closest friend uh, in New York, at least in the 1920s. And from, from the moment in 1925, when you're both winning these prizes and the opportunity literary contest. And so you're very close to, to, to Langston Hughes. You have a great relationship. In one of these uh, uh, folklore uh, uh, explorations, uh, uh, you, you go off with, with him. You spend uh, uh, about two or three months coming back from Mobile to New York, just I, wandering around the country with him. I ran into Langston in Mobile, and the problem with Langston is that he didn't drive. So he needed to ride back to New York, and I was going back to New York. So it was supposed to take us three days, and it took us three months, and I love that man. <laughs> So, so you have this great relationship with it. With it you know, I mean, you are ultimately. Let's let's just say it for the record that the, the two of you, Zora Neale Hurston and Langston Hughes, are the two great figures that come out of the Thank Harlem you, Renaissance. Thank you, sir. Thank right? you. And and you have this very close relationship. But then you write a play together. Yes. Mule Bone. Yes. Oops. There's the mule again. Langston knew how to write plays, but I knew folklore. So we decided to put our talents together and write this play. Well, somewhere along the line, Louise Patterson, who was a good friend of ours, was supposed to be typing the play. Well, I don't know how somehow that got shifted because Langston then decided that he wanted to give her a third of the credit for writing the play. A third play. For, for typing it? That's what I said. Nobody gives the typist credit for the play. So I taught him to support his girlfriends on his own talent. He wouldn't do it on mine. It, it, so you're fighting over this, and, and ultimately, somehow, the play makes it actually to a theater company in Cleveland. And the Gilpin players, they had it all staged. Well, Langston was sick, so I really wanted to go see him because his mother was there. And then I also wanted to make up to him about the play because I did not put just my name on that play. I sent the play to Carl Van Vechten to see what he thought about it. Well, he liked it, so he pushed it on. But Langston thought I did it. And I didn't do that. I was being fair. So I went to go apologize, and, and we worked it out about Louise, and that uh, she really wasn't his girlfriend because she was married to Wallace Thurman. <laughs> but when I was leaving Langston's house, she was coming up the sidewalk, so that was it, because he Oops. was lying to me again, so <laughs> no okay. play. There's also a, you know, a debate among the biographers and historians and literary critics about whether it really ended your relationship with Langston Oh, Hughes. no, it didn't end. We had a lot of space between us for a while. Uh, but you know, there was a time when I was living in New York, and I lived in this apartment building, and the woman who was the landlady who ran the building had a little son, and the little boy was crazy. Well, I go to Honduras, and while I'm gone, the little boy says I molested him. When I get off the plane in New York, they arrest me. 
And people were turning against me, and, and they were saying things about me, and they were quoting my work, saying that that shows that I did it. But Langston wrote a letter in support of me and said that he knew I didn't do anything like that. It was supposed to be uh, uh, sealed. It wasn't and they to be seemed so eager public. to want to believe that story. Yeah, give you, give you headlines, and, and, uh, and, and untrue, and was thrown out of court. Yes, it was a lie. So, uh, there's a story about how you got to, 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 the, to, to write your first novel, Jonah, uh, Jonah's uh, Gourd Vine. Mm -hmm. um, you're, you're doing your anthropology, your folklore, uh, and, and you're running out of money. Your story, Gilded Six Bits, a great short story, has been shown to a publisher in New York, uh, the Lippincotts. Mm -hmm. And so you're, you're being tossed out of your, your, your room, and, and you go and pick up your mail. I mean, t t this yeah. story, you go pick up your mail, and you didn't open the mail on yeah. the day you were thrown out. But inside... Was a check. For, for $200, a lot of money to a Zora Neale Hurston. A whole lot of money to me. And, and which was in advance, in advance on a novel yes. that you then wrote... Yes. ...in six weeks. I was in a hurry. I needed the rest of the money. <laughs> You, you become, you get great reviews and are pretty well known for Jonas Gordvon, your first novel. Then you go back to the folklore, you go off to Haiti, and, and you get sick, and, yeah. and there's also this story you tell about maybe a it's love violence. affair. Again, in Haiti, you sit down, and in mm -hmm. seven weeks, you write one of the great American novels, yeah. Their Eyes Were Watching Thank God. Thank you, sir. And, I was in love, and I had a great love. And I knew if I never had another one, I had to tell people about that one. So I went to Haiti, and I sat down, and, and I wrote out the story in a few weeks. So the, in, the, in, the, in the 1930s, you, you, it's, a, it's a miraculous decade for you. You write five yes. books. Yes. And, and all well-reviewed. That's a uh, lot in love. M m most of, a lot of love. <laughs> most, of, most of them sell well. And then you, you, you make it out in, in 1941-42. You make it out to Hollywood for a while, the only time you're well-paid in your life. And they, they look at all your books to, to maybe make a movie, but it takes us a while to actually get to make a movie of yours. But, um, but you write your, your great autobiography, Dust Tracks on the Road, uh, while, you're, while you're in Hollywood. But it's also the moment, it's such an interesting moment. It's a, World War II is, it has, has started by the time uh, Pearl Harbor's happened, by the time they come to publish it. And so they have to take a lot of uh, the, uh, three chapters, actually, out, because you're, you're kind of critical uh, of the, the United States. And, and maybe, I'm not critical of... of politics of the United States. So I, I wrote all of this before the war. You know, in all fairness, I never would have said those things had we already, had already been, been, in been in war. Because then you then write some things that are very supportive of the war. And in fact, after the war, um, you become maybe one of the leading, if not the leading, spokesman for the Republican side. I mean, you, you, you start to support, you support this guy, Glenn Reynolds, who runs yeah. against uh, Adam Clayton Powell in 1946. Well, you know, I, I am a conservative Republican, and people don't believe that about uh, Negro people. But I couldn't support Adam Clayton Powell because he reminded me too much of my daddy. <laughs> the man was a preacher, my daddy was a preacher. The man was biracial, my daddy was mulatto. The man was a womanizer, my daddy was a womanizer. I could not support him. And, and you know, in this period, the, the mid-40s, you reached the height, really, of your fame. You, you, you published your autobiography to great reviews, dust tracks. Uh, you win a lot of awards. You won, you win these Guggenheims and whatnot. You get the Annis Field Award for for uh, uh, civil rights, um, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, you are on the cover of Saturday Review. Yes. Uh, you're at the top of not just Black American literature, but American literature in 1943, yes. 1940. And, and your career kind of stalls. You write magazine articles for the Saturday Review, the Saturday Evening Post. You're a regular reviewer for the New York Herald Tribune, book reviewer. Um, but you, you write novels that you keep sending to Scribner's, and they keep sending them back, asking you to work on them, which you do, but nothing works. No, and they even say that it's not my writing. Uh, one time they accused me of having a ghostwriter. 
Uh, so I don't know what was wrong with those folks at Scribner, but they wouldn't take it. Knopf wouldn't take it. Uh, so I'm, I'm writing, and I'm trying to get Herod the Great published, and I'm working on that book. I'm polishing it. Uh, I'm doing everything to and, it. And you've you got these sort of obsessive quests going on for the Herod book and the novels that never get published and whatnot, and, and you're not getting advances anymore. You're living kind of a hand-to-mouth existence. In fact, at one point, you're living uh, in Miami or near Miami, but you, you became a maid. You actually took a job as a maid. I did. I was doing research for a book. Oh, doing research. <laughs> and, and, and at one point, you, your, your employer is reading the Saturday Review, and there's a story by her maid in the Saturday Review. But, but through all this, you're maintaining as is obvious, your sense of humor. Yeah. And you know, at one point, you, uh, you, you, you write a, a, a little essay called Negroes Without Self-Pity. And, and, and it seems to me that you know, the story of your life, through this, particularly through this last decade, where you're taking all these relatively menial jobs, you refuse charity from your own family, you're a true independent woman without any sense of, of self-pity. And, Thank you. Yeah. I'm broke, Mr. Kemper, and I knew that, but I also know that if I don't have any money when my time comes, they will bury me by subscription. <laughs> People will pitch in enough money, they'll put their pennies and their nickels and their quarters together until they get enough to bury me. So I don't really worry about that end of life stuff yet. I have to have my art. You, 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 you said as you, you know, you were, you went to the St. Lucie Wel Welfare Home and uh, after a stroke, he said, uh, you are alive, aren't you? Well, so, you wrote this as a note to yourself. Well, so long as you have no grave, you are covered by the sky. No That's limit right. to your possibilities. The distance to the heaven is the same everywhere. That's right. So ladies and gentlemen, I, I, I want to end by, by quoting Zora, Ms. Hurston, uh, from their eyes were watching God. She says, she pulled in her horizon like a great fishnet, draped it over her shoulder, so much of life in its meshes, she called her soul to come and see. And so Zora calls all of us to come and see. Ladies and gentlemen, Zora Neale Hurston. Zora did not have an easy life, but she was a survivor, and she was strong, and she was one of the early feminists. She made her own way in life, and she did whatever she had to do to get an education. Uh, she valued books, she valued reading, she valued her art, and she valued being a woman and an independent woman. And I hope that my audiences, and especially the young girls, take that away. Principal funding for Meet the Past with Crosby Kemper III has been provided by the Enid and Crosby Kemper Foundation.